So um, <clears throat> it's going to introduce our uh, next speaker, um, Dr. Ashrit Guha. He is uh, our uh, associate director of the VAT program at our uh, hospital, as well as uh, director of the RV failure and pulmonary hypertension program. He's going to be talking about advanced heart failure therapy and LVADs. Thanks, Imad. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. So we'll yeah, try to fit, uh, you know, I guess three days of conference into 15 minutes, but um, uh, so I'll quickly go over, you know, end-stage heart failure and mechanical assist devices. So during this talk, we'll go over uh, natural history of uh, heart failure, uh, clinical risk assessment in terms of how to assess end-stage heart failure, and uh, role of uh, hemodynamics and exercise testing, and a brief introduction to uh, continuous low LVADs and uh, just a couple of slides on second and third generation LVADs. So, so as a transition to what Arvind was. So just as a transition to what Arvind was talking about, he was talking mainly on um, uh, acute decompensated heart failure and on cardiogenic shock. This is the clinical course of somebody with chronic stable heart failure who as an onset of CHF, then your risk of sudden cardiac death increases, you know, immediately after you, you've had uh, heart failure, and then over a, there is a period where you're fairly stable. Then you start having decompensations, and then patients pass away from uh, pump failure. So, analogous to this is the stages of uh, heart failure, where you have stage A with just high risk with no symptoms. But most of us deal with patients in stage C heart failure, where patients have structural heart disease uh, with um, current or previous symptoms, and then they slowly progress to stage D heart failure. And this talk is really about how to recognize patients who are in advanced stage C or stage D heart failure. So again, you know, why is it important to um, differentiate, you know, what uh, you know, what stage you are in because your survival vastly differs. As you can see here, patients who have stage D heart failure, pretty much everyone's dead by five years. So stage D heart failure, it's as bad as having pancreatic cancer, even though, you know, the amount of press pancreatic cancer gets, you know, or stage D heart failure doesn't, but it's really, uh, you know, important to recognize because now really we can do something about it. So. Uh, the two most common presentations of stage D heart failure are ambulatory end stage heart failure or cardiogenic shock. So Dr. Beamraj just talked about cardiogenic shock. So we'll focus more on how to recognize these patients who are ambulatory and have end stage heart failure. So the most common thing that we all, you know, talk to our patients about is how they feel and, you know, whether they have any limitation of activity. So uh, I want you to particularly focus on class 3A and class 3B, where this is where you know, patients with advanced stage C heart failure lie. So patients who have class 3A are comfortable at rest, but less than ordinary activity causes symptoms. And class 3B are comfortable at rest, but minimal exertion causes symptoms. This is so vague and you know, so subjective. You know, how do you really quantify these things? And, this is just a table just to show how, you know, if you ask different people or even if you look at different studies, how st stage three has been defined differently in, in all these studies. But, you know, more and more, I think, uh, you know, there is, with, with a lot of the, the LVAT trials, I think we are coming to uh, some kind of consensus in terms of how to define them. But really, you, you focus on ADLs. You know, if people are not able to shower or dress themselves or, you know, you know, make coffee for themselves without getting short of breath, they are really class 3B. And, um, uh, and if you can do those but you can't, say, walk up a flight of stairs, then you're class 3A. Uh, and uh, again, this, 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 this study really goes on to show that how it's really different depending on the observers. And uh, almost 37% were classified differently if you were to just go off of an NYHA class. So you can't make, you know, NYHA class four is easy, one is easy, everything in between. There can be a lot of variation depending on the observers. 
So which is why you need something more and more objective to really classify these patients and uh, stratify them better. So that's where we come to cardiopulmonary exercise testing. So cardiopulmonary exercise testing is uh, you know, symptom-limited and a graded exercise test, either on treadmill or bike. So, the, and the protocols that we use here are usually, you know, sub-maximal. So when you use stress testing for, uh, you know, to detect uh, ischemia, most of those protocols are mostly maximal exercise. Whereas when you're looking at patients with, you know, advanced heart failure, you cannot run them on maximal, um, uh, you know, pro exercise protocols. So you use submaximal protocols, and you calculate peak oxygen consumption, ventilatory efficiency, and anaerobic threshold. Another thing that is that CPAT really helps you uh, look at is where um, the limitations coming from, because oftentimes when you take a patient who is say 70 years old and has COPD, heart failure you know, or, and they've never really done much for the last five years, it's hard to tease out how much of this is coming from what. And so cardiopulmonary exercise testing is really helpful in, you know, delineating that, but also helps in, uh, you know, determining one to three year prognosis in patients with, you know, advanced heart failure. So uh, one of the things that we look at is peak VO2, which is the maximal, um, oxygen consumption when somebody is uh, uh, exercising at peak exercise. And uh, if your oxygen extraction is you know, less than 10 ml per kilo per minute, then it indicates poor prognosis. But uh, transplant listing is, is reasonable if it's less than 14. Now in patients who are on <coughs> beta blockers, poor prognosis is under, um, you know, is under 12. Now there is some uh, gender uh, differences where women perform um, not as well. So for them, a cutoff of eight is probably reasonable, but you know, for the most part, under 10, you're really looking at somebody who has a survival of you know, less than 25%. This is from the original Donna Mancini paper, where you know, if you have less than 10, your survival is you know, less than 25% at the end of uh, 12 months. So uh, switching gears here, so this is um, another classification that we commonly use, especially in patients who are undergoing, you know, uh, LVAD implantation, is to, uh, you know, subclassify these patients who are uh, really NYHA class 3B um, uh, or more, and uh, trying to decide, you know, what, whether an intervention would be helpful in these patients and. Uh, uh, and you know what are their survivals? And uh, as you can see here, you know, so it goes from one through seven, and uh, you know, one through uh, one, and this you can call it a zero maybe. And uh, these are patients who have cardiogenic shock and are dying uh, currently. You know, who would need some kind of mechanical assist device, you know, in the next few hours to days, and. Uh, you know, the, number two are patients who are on inotropes but are not optimized on inotropes. And three are patients who are on inotropes but are stable and at home. So all these three patients, you know, set of patients, their six month, I mean, this, of course, within the next few weeks, survival is uh, questionable. But here you're looking at uh, a 12 year mortality of greater than 75% if you're in Intermax uh, uh, three. And Intermax 4, you're looking at a 12-month survival of about 50%. But these, uh, you know, again, it's, it's very hard to tease them out. But uh, again, their one-year survival is also uh, kind of limited. And what uh, this has been really used, useful in is to trying to determine uh, whether, you know, as you go up the Intermax scale, if durable LVAD support uh, would be beneficial in these patients. So again, in terms of, you know, just an overlap with, uh, you know, peak VO2 and also NYHA class, as you can see here, Intermax 4, you know, your peak VO2 is definitely, you know, less than 12, and uh, these are all whom you can call as ambulatory, you know, class 4 symptoms 
where you have rest dyspnea for most of the day, but they are still ambulatory. Now, what about hemodynamics? Like Dr. Bhimraj said, I think uh, hemodynamics is something that we use a lot in stage, um, advanced stage C and stage D patients to determine their prognosis, but also to you know, uh, help uh, address the, the kind of support that these patients need. Um, and uh, this is the classic profiles of heart failure that you know, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of. And as you can see here, those patients who are really you know, dry and cold, uh, you know, th those are the patients, um, you know, and, and wet and cold, these, these two profiles don't, don't do very well. And as you can see here, the ones which, you know, with C, which is wet and cold, who are congested and have poor uh, cardiac output, uh, they don't do well uh, over the, ne you know, the next 18 months. Um, and again, a brief uh, mention about etiology of uh, cardiomyopathies, especially the restrictive ones, you know, like uh, infiltrative cardiomyopathies, whether amyloid, hemochromatosis, they have a poor prognosis. So these patients, uh, you know, you really have to consider them as stage uh, C or D, even though they might not have uh, a lot of, you know, the, the, the classic uh, signs and symptoms of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Again, another thing that we all look at in determining whether somebody is, you know, advanced stage C is the number of hospital admissions they've had. And uh, this is a study uh, from the Canadian database looking at uh, the number of uh, uh, admissions. As you can see here, if you've had three admissions or more, you're looking at 50% uh, uh, one-year uh, survival uh, after acute decompensated heart failure. So these are the ESC criteria for advanced heart failure. Again, repeated hospitalization, progressive deterioration of end organ uh, dysfunction, um, rising BUN, creatinine, and intolerance to heart failure goal-directed medical therapy, and, and low blood pressure, and uh, NYHA class 3B or class 4 symptoms, and frequent ICD shocks. So if you have these you know, patients with these uh, the uh, symptoms or signs or, um, um, or laboratory manifestations, these are the patients who sh should be referred to uh, uh, advanced heart failure uh, transplant uh, program. Now, switching gears, I don't have too much time to talk about LVADs, but I'll you know, talk about them for a couple of minutes. So big picture, you know, in patients with stage D heart failure, Continuous flow LVADs have been shown to be better than inotropes. So that was the classic rematch study, which was, you know, that was with um, uh, um, uh, pulsatile pumps, but uh, that was uh, the heart made XVE. And again, that was compared to continuous flow LVADs. And currently, this is the, the, the second generation LVAD, which is the heart made two. And worldwide right now, I think there are about 25,000 plus patients who have undergone uh, implantation. And uh, through all the registry data, you're looking at about uh, 50 percent, uh, 50 to 60 percent, depending on whether you're destination therapy or bridge to transplant, survival at three years. Um, uh, and this is an axial flow device where this is the rotor, and this is the inflow cannula, and this is the outflow cannula. Uh, and, uh, and this is um, the, the one which goes, this is the drive line which goes out to the controller. And um, uh, these are the batteries and this is the power module which um, is connected to, to power the pump. Uh, and this is the pocket controller that I was talking about. Again, this is all relevant to HeartMate 2. Now, what this pretty much does like Dr. Bhimraj was talking about was as you know, you unload uh, the patient as you go up on the RPMs. All these pumps, the only thing you can set is the RPM. And as you increase the RPM, as you can see here, there is loss of pulsatility, but there is an increase in the mean blood pressure and a decrease in pulse pressure, suggesting that you lose a pulse. So this is sort of the common physiologic principle with all continuous flow LVADs. And, uh, this is the newer generation LVADs. These are the third generation you know, centrifugal flow pumps, uh, which are um, centrifugal, so the, uh, the blood flow is at right angles to, uh, to the pump and not in, in line. 
but both uh, you know HVAD and HeartMate 3 are magnetically levitated, and, uh, um, uh, and this is actually HeartMate 3, which has a modular drive line and and uh, you know may have intrinsic pulsatility. So these are you know if you can just the size of these pumps are really really small, and both are kind of pericardial pumps, so they do not need another pocket in the sub, subdiaphragmatic, uh, they don't, in the subdiaphragmatic area. And uh, just two quick slides on their outcomes. This was the uh, endurance uh, study which was uh, published on HVAT. And again, a two-year survival was no different than, um, um, uh, than HeartMate 2. And uh, this was the pivotal HeartMate 3 study this was from the six-month um, data showing event-free survival actually better than HeartMate 2. And this, I don't have the two-year uh, data, which was just published in NJM in April, again confirming, I think an event-free survival of 74% at two years um, um, uh, with, uh, with HeartMate 3. So I think you know, as we are going through different generations of devices, the survival is improving. So I think the next, gen next phase is going to be you know, looking at probably completely implantable pumps where you know, there is transdermal energy transfer and so on and so forth. So I think we are still in the you know, nascency of the whole continuous flow or, or, or implantable devices. Um, so with that, I would like to end my talk. I'm sorry for going over time. But